on a series of sermons from the book of Judges. I hope that uh, God has um, showed you some things about uh, how he wants us to be as individuals, how that he wants to bring back his glory to his nation, and how he uses uh, individuals whom you probably would not have used, okay? But uh, God has no respect to person, and God always likes to pull a surprise on us, amen? So uh, we're so excited about that. We're going to talk about vanishing values of our nation today, and it's from Judges 17.6, and Judges 17.6 says basically this, that in those days there were no kings in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Let's pray. Father God, as we come to you today, I pray that you touch my throat, and Lord, that I'll be able to speak with power and authority and confidence. Lord, as uh, we've said, we have so many people that uh, are being affected by this pandemic, and uh, Lord, I just pray for healing and restoration and for divine protection in your encamp of your angels round about us. And Lord, I also pray for our nation as we're still struggling, but Lord God, we, we know that you're in control and you're sovereign over the matter, and so we're not worried, we're not afraid, we're people of faith, and things are going to work out, and hopefully there'll be a spiritual awakening and a great revival in our land because of all this. Lord, help us to, to preach with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you that you've left your spirit behind so that we can get your work done. Because this is something that is not motivational speaking or pop psychology or some kind of um, uh, speech. Lord, when we get up and, and preach a sermon, it, it, it's a special uh, time. It's a time in which you anoint your speaker and I speak forth the word of God and the Holy Spirit seeds that word of God within our hearts and it begins to germinate and root and bloom and blossom and sprout and becomes a tremendous product or uh, production of your kingdom. So Lord God, forgive me of any sins that may be um, uh, keeping me from communicating. Lord, help me uh, not to let pride or arrogance get in the way. Lord, help me to be a, a man of humility and authentic, authentic spirituality and integrity. And uh, Lord, I just pray, Father, that you will work during this message not only to mold and make those that hear it, but also to mold and make me into a better servant for the Lord God Almighty. And Lord, we'll make sure that you get the praise and honor and glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen and amen. Well, if there's ever a day that our nation needs some prayer, it's today. Amen. Uh, we're in a state of confusion, as you all know about things. And, um, you know, I, I, I pray during this last series of sermons that God will just help me to communicate to you some things that maybe we can do as people of God to bring back the glory of God to our nation. It doesn't surprise us that uh, a lot of our morals and ethics and Christian values have been eroded. And that's why America was once a, a great and glorious and godly nation because our original constitution was founded on biblical principles. And uh, our forefathers, you know, they, they weren't embarrassed to talk about the Bible or uh, the, you know, God of heaven and earth. And, you know, but now we, we've seen to, to get away from that. And I'm praying that God will restore us. So today, get out your outlines. Here we go. We're going to look at the sad case of vanishing values. The first thing I want you to see is the reason or, or what really uh, happens when values um, vanish. Well, look at Judges chapter 17, verse 6. Here there is a key verse, a, a pivotal verse. It says that in that day they had no king, and the men did what was what? Right in their own eyes. That's pitiful that, or pivotal that you understand this. If you're going to understand the last several chapters of the book of Judges, we see that uh, they didn't have a solid leadership. They didn't have uh, absolute values. They didn't have authority. And that men became their own authority. And those men and women back in the book of Judges, because they had no great leadership and spirituality and authenticity, uh, they began to choose what they believed to be right. 
And, you know, the, the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seemeth right to man, but the end thereof is death. You and I cannot make up morals. You know why? Because that's God creator that establishes morals. Amen? And so here we, we see them in a society like ours. Um, they kind of got this idea, you're okay, I'm okay, uh, don't judge me and I won't judge you. So here we see in the book of Judges, that men begin to do what was right in their own eyes. Now, if you think about that, that's kind of the condition of America, amen? You know, we have so many people that uh, lack godly values and principles and morals and ethics, and, uh, and because uh, all those values are dissipating or vanishing, we wonder where did they go to? Well, first of all, I believe that we have somehow demoralized sin. You know, we don't call sin, sin anymore. We call it a sickness or a disease. Have you ever noticed that? Uh, also, what about the dysfunction in our society, <laughs> even in our families? None of us are right at times, if you know what I mean. Amen? And, and think about uh, all uh, the drug addiction and alcoholism and, and uh, broken marriages and broken families and the scars it's leaving on our children and our grandchildren. Think about how there's a slump in ec uh, economic, or I'm sorry, um, academic performance. You know, we see all that happening. But also, what do you think about the disfigurement of public places, the tearing down of, of statues and monuments by extremists or insurrectionists or socialists or communists, whatever you want to call them. We are having a major disturbance in America today. And as you listen to the news, the media, um, the editorials, you know, you don't have to have a lot of sense to realize we're all in trouble, amen? We really are, and uh, when you think about our educational institutions and then the political systems of today, there seems to be a lot of liberalism, I'll get in a minute, a liberalism that uh, is coming about. You know, people say they believe in God, but they don't believe in the God that, that you and I believe in. Uh, they even, uh, some of them are, are so liberal that they don't believe in God. They, they question the integrity, the authenticity of the word of God. And, and even when they use the name God, you, you really wonder, do you really mean it? Or are you using it and, as your personal agenda to try to reach more people? So, you know, we've got a lot of inconsistencies and hypocrisies. And I know that worries many of us. You look at the music industry and the movie industry. I mean, they're glamorizing sin more than ever before. And so we, we have a generation of people, and this is what saddens me about the younger generation. And we see them not attending church at all. And it's because that through our education systems or through our political institutions or through uh, our somewhat mentoring these, this younger generation, they're beginning to question the existence of God. They're beginning to wonder about the integrity and the inspiration and the authority of the Bible. Uh, they even don't believe in the sanctity and fidelity of marriage. And they're questioning family values altogether. Have you seen all the brokenness in families? I mean, the last 20 or 30 years, I'll be honest with you, I, I begin to wonder whether I can relate to this world because this world has changed even in the last couple of, of, of decades. We, we're growing into a secular nation. And that scares me because we were founded on biblical principles. And no wonder parents are afraid to raise up their kids, you know, in the society we live in. I, I, you know, my, all my kids are in church, and I praise God for that. But I, I, I got two grandkids. And, you know, I wonder what kind of society are they going to be raised up in? You know, will they become atheists? Will they become agnostic? Will they um, uh, go the, the route of, of Christianity? Or what, what kind of lifestyle will they have? You know, we do the best we can to raise up our kids and grandkids, amen? I mean, I, I try to pray with uh, my um, uh, Killian. You know, he knows about Jesus. I try to talk to him about Jesus. And uh, over his little bed in our uh, room, we have a manger scene, and he talks about the sheep and go back, you know, and uh, talks about all that and baby Jesus and, you know, the angels. But 
Will he grow up to become a strong Christian? Or will this secular society get him away from the things of God? We all have some concerns, don't we? Amen? Amen? What's going on? What's going on in our, our society today? I think America is sick. We are in desperate need of a movement of God, a revival, not only in the churches, but a spiritual awakening in our communities, in our, our cities. And, and if we don't have that, one of my greatest fears is one day a professor or a historian will stand up in a university and talk about the rise and fall of America. What happened so long ago in Israel that was recorded in the book of Judges is warning us you see, we've really not changed that much since the ancient times. Oh, we may have got sophisticated in our technology, but we're still making the same spiritual mistakes. And here in the book of Judges, we see time after time after time a cycle in which people will come back to God, then they get comfortable, and then they get involved in the things of this world, and then adversities or adversaries come up, and then they cry out to God, and God hears them, and God delivers them, and all of a sudden they do the same cycle. Will we ever learn, people? See, if we don't learn from our past, we're bound to repeat it. Amen? And thus we see that so much here in that day as well as this day, men and women are doing what is right in their own sight. Now, number two, the second thing I want you to look at is not only the reality of what happens when values vanish, but I want you also to see the results of what happens when values vanish. Now, we have some biblical stories here. Now, they're probably not for me or uh, to you. You know, we, we know about Daniel in the lion's den and the three Hebrew children, you know, and we know all these uh, wonderful stories. But this is a story that shows us some things that you and I can relate with that we probably, if we read it, we didn't comprehend it. The first thing I want you to see is when uh, values begin to vanish, here's what happens. It produces, write it down, Families without a foundation. Families without a foundation. Here in Judges chapter 17, you can read it when you go home because of the brevity of time here. But here we see uh, an insight. We go right into the home of one of the, the wealthy families during that time in the book of Judges. And they had a son by the name of Micah. Micah is a wonderful name. It literally means who is like Jehovah. Who is like our God. Amen. Amen. But Micah did something. He stole 1,100 shackles of silver. But he had a tinge of consciousness. Thank God for consciousness, amen? And he brought it back to his mother, and his mother um, thanked him for his transparency, his honesty. And then she gave him that silver and said, I want you to go dedicate it to God. Well, you know, we, we often think, you know, when I first read this, I thought, oh, my goodness. Now, you know, they're, they're giving to the Lord's work. They're giving their tithes and offerings. But let me tell you something. This story had the strangest twist I've ever seen. Here we see Micah taking the silver, and he takes it to a silversmith, and guess what he has made out of it? Trinkets and figurines of gods and goddesses. And guess what they had in their own home? They had a shelf full of those figurines of God and goddesses. What is going on here? Well, I begin to, to see some similarities even in our families today. Families uh, tend to be, um, how can I say it, uh, uh, spiritually and morally confused about things. Uh, you know, here was a family, um, a family that, that had a bizarre way of showing their dedication to God. You know, they were full of idolatry and um, uh, thievery and disrespect toward uh, a parent and, you know, all kinds of inconsistencies. And they thought that they could serve God along with a bunch of gods and goddesses. My friends, if that's not America, I don't know what is. We have homes and families that are morally and spiritually in confusion. Now, these people may have a religious background. Uh, they may be affiliated with a church somewhere. They may even be a member of a church somewhere. But somehow they lack the, how can I put it, the morals, the, the spirituality that comes with a family value. 
Uh, you look at us, and I'm talking about me. You know, we all have inconsistencies. Amen? We all need to, for people to pray for us. We all need to step up and, and do better. But I want you to know that these people back then are just like us. They lack integrity in their spirituality. You know, think about Christianity of the first century. Many of you were here when I preached a series in the book of Acts, and, man, these people were on fire for the Lord, weren't they? I mean, they were willing to be martyred for the cause of Christ. But look at Christianity today. What have we become? we become cold and callous and complacent and compromising. Uh, we even have churches that have watered down the gospel. They, they, they come soft because they don't want to offend anybody or lose anybody in the congregation. My God, our, uh, you know, our church's attendance are going down. We don't need to lose anybody else. And we tend to make it palatable. Does that make sense? We don't tell people about repenting and dealing with their sins anymore. We tell them they have a disease or a mental illness and they need to go see a psychiatrist. We're not telling people that they need to pay faith in Christ anymore. We're telling them to have faith in themselves. We're not telling them that they need to totally, completely, thoroughly surrender to Christ, but they are to, to do uh, as they see fit, that, that it's their own life, it's their own body. But let me tell you something, your body is not your own. It's the creator gods of the universe. My friends, your life is not your own. God created you for a, a divine plan and purpose and program in your own lives. And thus, we see a lot of, of families in, what should I say, moral and spiritual confusion. You know, we've gotten so self-centered, haven't we? I'm talking about me too, so, you know, remember if I'm pointing my finger at you, I have three fingers pointing back at me. We've gotten so self-centered. And we're so self-absorbed that we think our excuses are legit about not going to worship or witnessing or working. You know, I have people that, that tell me, I would go to church, but I'm afraid I'll expose our older people. But they go to the groceries. They go to the doctor's office, to the dental office, and they get it there. There is no safe place except in the hand of the almighty God of the universe. What's happened to our Christianity? It's become diluted and watered down. Sad to say. Are you all getting what I'm saying? We become very worldly and don't even realize it. We care more for the world's activities than we do for the people, place, and things of God. It's heartbreaking. When you have people that, that go to all these activities and allurements and entertainments and enticements but they somehow think it's legit to make an excuse not to come to the house of God now, I realize if you've been exposed to this virus or if you haven't you don't need to be here amen I understand that but let me tell you, some of people I believe are using it as an excuse and we are in a real dire situation if you have the virus or exposed, stay away from us. Amen. We'll pray for you. But if you don't, don't make an excuse because you've been around, uh, you know, someone whose cousin, who third remote had had it. Amen. You get what I'm trying to say here. Yeah, we, we have um, some real confusion going on, even within Christendom. You know, I, I, in every church I pastored, I've seen good families go right down. I've led them to Christ. I baptized them, buried their dead, led their children to Christ and baptized them, mentoring them. They were in good leadership positions. They were rising stars in the church. But what happened? People get involved in this, get involved in that, get involved in all these activities of the world that you don't see them anymore. They're completely out of church. When their children used to talk about what they want to be in life was pastors and missionaries. Now what do they want to be? Baseball players, football players, and basketball players. Now, I'm not saying you can't serve God through those avenues. Amen? I love those stars that, that are Christians and are bold and courageous in proclaiming their faith. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But my friends, we are getting our younger generation away 
from the church and Christianity and God's call upon their life when we consume them with the things of the world and don't keep them faithful to their local churches. Well, I didn't know, I didn't think I'd get too many amens all that one, but that's fine. Let me tell you a story I heard. Heard it happened in the state of Missouri. There were two preacher kids. They uh, found a dog. It was a friendly dog. It was black and had some white streaks down its tail, and they wanted to keep the dog. So they went to their um, preacher daddy and said, Daddy, can we keep the dog? And dad, he loved dogs. He said, yes, we can keep him. But later on, they began to find out that there was some family that moved into the community that had a similar dog, and it was lost. So the, the kids were really nervous about it, and they told their dad. Now, remember, he's a preacher dad, okay? And uh, dad said, let's get some dark shoe polish. And we will, we will make that tail black so when they come, a preacher, okay? Uh, so when they come, we can say, hey, that, this dog is ours. It didn't fit your description. And so the family came, and they could have swore that was their dog. But they, did, they were new in the community. didn't want to cause any problems. So they went on their merry way. Guess who those two preacher boys were? Frank and Jesse James. Does that sound familiar? Notorious criminals of the heartland of America. Here that preacher daddy got to keep a dog but lost two of his boys. Amen? Now, you know, I, you all know, most of you know my, my parents, and, of course, you know, Dad died uh, several months ago, and Mom's in assisted living. But I was raised in a good Christian home. I mean, I love my mom and dad, so don't misunderstand what I'm trying to say. But even good Christian homes are not perfect. Amen? I mean, my home's not perfect. And I'm a pastor. I understand this. But, you know, as I begin to think about how my dad raised me, I begin to see some inconsistencies. And probably if you talk to my son, they could tell you I had some inconsistencies too. Remember those fuzz busters? Remember those? On the dashboard, dad had one. I thought that was the most fascinating thing. I loved it because we could break the law and, and get where we're getting. But, but what was that teaching me? How to break the law. Have you ever heard parents say, now, honey, I, I, I want you to tell or stretch the truth a little bit. I want you to tell them that you're this age and not your real age, because if so, we can get into this theater or we can get into this restaurant cheaper. Come on, don't look at me like you've probably never done that, all right? Some of you got your mask on. I, I know, I see your eyes, you know. Um, I'll never forget before the pandemic, I, I love to visit in homes and love to knock on doors, can't do that anymore, but I remember one time I was visiting this family and, you know, the little girl came to the door and I said, well, is your mommy and daddy home? And, and she says, well, mommy told me to tell you they're not home. <laughs> so, so a lot of us got some cracked foundations, okay? <laughs> so, you know, none of us are perfect, amen? But when, van when values vanish, it produces families without foundations. Number two, here we go. I'm going to be preaching to me. Number two, when we have vanishing values, it will produce not only families without foundations, but it will produce pastors, spiritual leaders without principle. Again, uh, go home and read the book of Judges, uh, chapter 17. I think it starts there from eight, verse 8 to verse 13. But we find that there was a preacher without a place to stay. He was a Levite. We're not told his name. But he didn't have a place to stay. He didn't have a place to minister. And Micah heard about it. So Micah goes up to this uh, minister that's looking for a place to minister and says, Hey, we're one of the wealthiest families in, in the nation. Won't you come and be our personal pastor? Matter of fact, we got a good deal for you. We will lodge you, we will feed you, we will clothe you, and we'll give you a salary. Sound like a pretty good deal, amen? Hey, you, you, do need to keep, keep, uh, you do need to care for your pastor, amen? There's nothing wrong with that. But here was the problem when you start to investigate this. Here we see a man of God becoming a hireling. Yes, we ought to support our pastors, but our pastors are not to be hirelings. Does that make sense? 
They're to be men of God. Listen to what Jesus says about a hireling here in, in uh, John chapter uh, 10, verses 12 and following. He says, but I hireling, one who is wanting money more than ministry, okay? He who is not a, he is not a shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. See what's going here? Here's our problem. We have prophets. I wish I'd have had this down on your outline. I don't think it is. Write it down. We have prophets for profit. We have prophets for profit. You got it? Hey, think about it. I'm not saying every TV evangelist is this way, but we have a, uh, the last several years, I've been interested in, uh, you know, what's going on in Christendom. And uh, we have a lot of people, not all of them, that are TV evangelists or, or what, faith healers or miracle workers. And all of a sudden, they are living like rock stars. Do you know that some of them even have private jets? A lot of them have mansion estates. Not just one, but more than one. Also, they become millionaires because they have gotten unsolicited money from their constituency or from their followers, and they basically indirectly said or hinted to it, if you will give to my ministry, you'll be healed of your terminal illness. Or if you give to my ministry, you'll become a millionaire too. The wealth, health, and prosperity religion. My friends, they're charlatans. Amen? Do you got what I'm trying to say here? They're charlatans. And, and you know, uh, God wants us. Uh, uh, Pastor, are you saying that a uh, pastor ought not to be paid? Of course not. What I'm saying, he's, he shouldn't pastor for the money or for the salary. Oh, I, I could have went to other churches, other places, and got a, a better salary. But, you know, God called me here. And you can't go uh, by the call of the salary. you got to go by the call of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And, and that's what I'm trying to teach you here. Even uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 14, they that preach the word ought to live by the word. In 2 Timothy chapter uh, 5, verse 17, it says that the elder that rules, rules well is worthy of du double honor. So what I'm saying is that uh, men of God is not to be hirelings. They're not to be compromising biblical convictions to cater to their financial contributors. But you know what's happening in America? We have pastors that are watering down the gospel not speaking about sin or hell or repentance or faith or surrender to Jesus Christ because they don't want to offend their financial contributors. Do you understand where I'm going with all of this? You see, Micah, personal pastor, basically taught, told them what they wanted to hear. Micah was, was saying, should we go uh, and, and take this city? Uh, should we plunder this city? And you're going to find out later that they wanted what someone else had. And guess what this prophet said? Go ahead, do it. God will be with you. Peace, peace, peace. Blessing, blessing, blessing. You understand where I'm coming from? You know, I believe that there is nothing in America that we couldn't radically, dynamically change if we had generations of God-called preachers. Not preachers that tickle people's ears, but, but preachers who are not man-pleasers, but God-pleasers. Preachers who won't try to run a popularity contest in their churches. Now, I have to be very careful in what I'm going to say here because I have people on uh, Facebook and YouTube that watch me from these certain areas and know the church I'm talking about, so i got to keep it generic, all right? But I'll never forget. I left a church I should never have left. God was moving tremendously. But this church began to court me. Now, don't you tell anybody. You know what I'm talking about, son. But anyway, this church began to court me. And oh, my, you talk about a church that someone would want to go to and be taken care of the rest of their life. I was making six-digit salary there. But guess what I found out? Not everything that glitters is gold. 
There are fool's gold out there. I'll never forget, the church began to grow. We were um, top in the top ten churches in baptisms. We were, we, were, we were growing. I mean, we were reaching minorities. Uh, we were reaching all socioeconomic classes. I mean, I thought I had found heaven here on earth. Until one day, I had some millionaires come in, and it was a multi-millionaire church. And they said, Preacher, we want to be your advisory board. And I thought, that's great. I mean, you know, what pastor wouldn't want people to help him grow the church? Well, I found out uh, during that meeting, they were trying to tell me uh, what kind of people I was supposed to reach. We, were gonna, we wanted to be a country club church. Don't bring any Afro-Americans in here. They liable to marry some of our white girls. Then they told me what to preach, how long to preach. And you know, back then I was young and I had, I had brass, okay? Uh, you see me here today in this church, I've always been the peacemaker. Uh, taking a lot of flack for things. But back then I was young and I had some brass. And as they began to tell me how I was going to pastor and who I was going to reach and what I was going to preach about, I looked at them and I said, all right, if you want me to obey you, you show me the nail-scarred hands and feet. You show me the spear-pierced side. You show me the brow where the thorns had punctured. Boy, that was the beginning of the end. Since then, I've had several people call me and said they should have stood up for me. And some of them are watching probably right now. Scary times when we live in Christendom that caters to financial contributors. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says a preacher is not to flatter his people. He's not to tell them what they want to hear, but what they need to hear. He is addressed, he's supposed to address sin. He's supposed to talk about our inconsistencies. Not in a judgmental way, because we all are crackpots. Amen? Uh, he's supposed to talk to us about surrender and not soften the gospel and say, you're saved um, just by grace, you can do whatever you want. Well, let me tell you something. When you become a Christian, you won't want to do everything you want. Man, God takes your, your, your um, how can I say, your, your uh, want to's and he brings in the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit and all of a sudden you don't want to do those things. You don't want to live that way. That God begins to move and the Holy Spirit begins to fill your heart and you begin to get convicted and burdened over the way you're living. And when you really get close and intimate and transparent to God, guess what happens? You reach a whole state of peace and serenity and security and victory that you've never had before. Listen to what Proverbs 27.5 says. It says, open rebuke is better than secret love, and a faithful are the wounds of a friend. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. You know how you can tell if you have a true friend or not? If they tell you what you need to hear and not always what you want to hear. Apostle Paul, the, the Galatian church was being turned against him, and he said, who has bewitched you? And then in Galatians chapter 4 verse, 9, 4, verse 16, he says, Have I become your enemy because I have told you the truth? Listen to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 5. It says, Better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to have and hear the songs of fools. You know, before the pandemic hit, we had churches that were being packed. Not our church, of course, but churches being packed. People would go and they, they wanted this pop psychology sermon or self-help sermons. And there's nothing wrong with self-improvement sermons. But they, they wanted all these sugar coats, Dr. Feelgood sermons. They want people that would tickle their ears. And this is exactly what happened with this pastor in Micah's family. He said, peace, peace, peace. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. But you'll let me tell you something. A true 
minister of the gospel will say, if you want God's blessing, you have to be obedient and surrender to him. If you want God's peace, then you've got to surrender totally and completely because there's no greater serenity than surrendering to the Lord God Almighty. Amen? Listen to what I um, read in one of the Christianity Today uh, magazines. If if I were to tell you uh, who did this or who wrote this, uh, you would know it. I mean, he's a very popular uh, TV preacher. But this is what he says. He says, I don't know of anything that has been done in the name of Jesus and under the banner of Christianity that has proven more destructive to human personality and hence counterproductive to evangelistic enterprise than the often uh, crude, uncouth, uh, unchristian strategy of attempting to make people aware of their lostness and their sinful condition. He goes on to say this. He says, my number one role is that I do not want to do anything that would turn someone off so they are not be opening to listening to my invitation to accept Jesus Christ. Now listen to what he says this, to accept Jesus Christ as your best friend. Did you catch that? Listen to me very closely. I need Jesus more than being my best friend. I need him to be my Savior and my Lord. I need him to save me from my sins, amen? The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. You know what? Not only do I need him as my Savior, more than my best friend, I need him as my Lord. Why? Because in and of myself, I'm self-destructive, amen? In and of myself, I can get out of control pretty easy. I need the Lord to direct me. And that's why the Proverbs 14, 12 says this. It says, there's a way that seemeth right to man, but the end thereof is death. I know I've heard people say, well, so-and-so has a good heart. But you know, that's not always biblical. I understand what you're saying. But you know what the Bible says about the heart? Of an individual, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? My friends, if the Bible is true, and I believe it is, I need a Savior and I need a Lord. And here's the most beautiful thing about it. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, guess what you find out about Jesus? He is your best friend. He's your wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And all of God's people said, Amen and amen to that. So what is my responsibility? I, I, I used to believe my responsibility was to pack a church. That's not my responsibility as a pastor. My responsibility is not to fill up this auditorium with people. My responsibility is to fill up this auditorium with the word of God. There's the point. Amen. Now, the third thing I want you to see, and it, uh, when we have vanishing values, It's going to produce a government without God. Judges chapter 18, you can read that entire chapter when you go home. That's why I give you the outlines so you can study it. But here we have a problem with a tribe of Israelites by the name of Dan. Uh, There were 12 tribes that went into the promised land, and Dan was one of them. Dan happened to be one of the smallest of tribes, but they weren't satisfied with what they got. God gave each of them a portion of the land, and they were to go in and take it. But, you know, they, they didn't want to work for it. They wanted what someone else possessed. So this tribe of Dan went and attacked a city by the name of Lasha. Lasha, I'm sorry. And uh, they plundered the city and took what was not theirs. You know what I'm finding out in America? We've got a group of people just like that. They want what someone else has worked hard for. Do you hear me? They don't want to work hard. They don't want to pay for it. They want it given to them. You know what the Bible says about a person that doesn't work? It's very strong. Don't get mad at me. I didn't write the Bible. Amen? 2 Thessalonians 3.10 says, If a man will not work, neither, or neither, however you want to pronounce it, shall he eat. That's pretty strong, isn't it? And here we we have, uh, in America, half of America 
uh, let's just use that in generalities. I don't have the, the percentile, but we got half of America that wants, but they don't want to work for it. So we have taxed the middle class to get more taxes to give them what they're not willing to work for. I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry. That's apology. That's the way it is. Now, Pastor, what about welfare? What about governmental assistance? You know, I'm all for that for two reasons. Number one, if a person physically cannot work. Number two, if a person has, how can I say it, psychological mental issues. See that little boy back there? Sitting by Amy, named Connor. Connor has a Kabuki syndrome and autism. He will not speak. There's no way he could work. We didn't start drawing anything from him until what? He's 21? And I know kids that were younger that were making more. Something's not right here, people. And then you got the rest of us who say, why work hard? They're just going to tax our hard-earned dollars, and we're just going to give it to somebody else. So we kind of rob people of the thrill and the zeal of working. Do you know that if you are married, if you are honoring God's uh, sanctity of marriage, that you have to take care of your kids, but if you are not married, the government will pay for your child delivery. Even the older people. Uh, the older people, I, I, I saw this in Florida and it really shocked me, but I'd have older people come up to me and say, well, we want to get married. And I said, well, that's great. Um, you know, just go to the, the government office, get your marriage certificate, and we'll get, oh, no, pastor, we, we don't want that certificate. We don't want to make this legal. We want you to marry us in the eyes of God because if we make this legal, we're going to lose this supplement and this supplement and this supplement. What is that teaching our people to live immoral? I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry. Why do I keep apologizing? It is what it is, sad to say. So here we, we, we have government without God, because we've lost our value when it comes to the sanctity and the faithfulness, the fidelity of marriage. Turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. I want to show you something else here. You know, I'm amazed at how these people 2,000 years ago plus were so inspired by the word of God, by the Holy Spirit, that they could see down the corridors of time and guess what? Make an accurate prediction of what is going to happen. Now let me read this to you. They were with me, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Okay, we got it up there. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. We're in perilous times. No one would debate that. Now remember, this was written 2,000 years ago. <laughs> For men shall be lovers of their own self. Oh my, me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity, and we're all that way at one time or another. Covetous, they want what's not theirs. They want to grab it, and they want to get it. Boasters, proud, blasphemers. Man, have, have you seen the, the, the dirt that, that people have and how they run the name of God in vain and uh, the, the name of Jesus through a cesspool. Disobedient to parents, oh my. You know, we see that rampantly. I once told dad before he died, I said, if you'd whip me uh, today like you did uh, in the day I was a kid, you'd be in jail. <laughs> my dad didn't abuse me. But guess what? A good spanking didn't hurt me either. Now, I agree with child abuse. I understand that. Unthankful. They're not thankful for what they got. Unholy. Boy, we see that. Without natural affections. Parents not loving their children. Children not loving their parents. Husbands not loving their wives. And wives not loving their husbands. 
truth breakers. You know, used to, if a man told you something or a woman told you something, it was as good as done. You didn't have to have any legal document. All they had is a handshake as good as done. But now we don't see that, do we? Politicians breaking their promise. We see marriage vows, people breaking their promise to their spouses. False accusers, incontinent theorists, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, uh, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. If that's not a picture of our world today, I don't know what is. Now here, I've got a rush. Here's the next point I want you to see. What were the realities that caused all this? And I've got to really move here. In Romans chapter 1, it talks about um, the realities that caused this vanishing of morals and values in our land today. And notice what it says there, and uh, I, I probably won't read it to you, but just turn to Romans chapter 1, verse um, 21. One of the reasons why that our values have vanished is, number one, foolish speculation. You know, America didn't want to turn to God. Have you ever watched all the uh, politicians? My wife doesn't know I watch that at night, but don't tell her while well, she's out here. Uh, she kind of puts them on a curfew. But you know what I've heard every side? I'm not just talking about one side, every side. I hear them saying, well, we got to rely on science. We got to rely on secular education. We got to rely on economy. We got to rely on a political movement to get us back on track. But you never hear them say, we got to turn to God. In 2 Chronicles 7 14, it says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then shall I hear from heaven and forgive their lands, or forgive their sins and heal their lands. We got to turn to God. Amen. Number two. We see from uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 22. Uh, here we see what I want to call the death of common sense. You know, we profess ourselves to be wise, we become as fools. The idea there is that uh, we are trusting and we think we're so smart, we're so intelligent, uh, we're so educated. But guess what? We don't have the common sense to discern between right and wrong anymore and good and evil. That's why our, van our, our morals are vanishing, is because we think we're wiser than God. When God says, thy shalt not, you know what he's trying to do? He's trying to say, don't hurt yourself. Think about it. You know, politicians, they talk about values. But when you ask them what values they're talking about, they get quiet. Think about in our public school systems. Do you know you're not allowed to teach about God or morals or ethics or the Bible, but your children can go to a sex class and learn about sex techniques and birth control. Also, in some of our um, public school clinics, medical uh, health clinics, um, they can't give a child an aspirin without parental consent. But if that girl goes and says she's pregnant, they can take her to an abortion clinic and get rid of the baby, and no one has to know about it. We profess ourselves to be wise. We become as fools. Are you getting this? Say amen. Notice something else here, too. Um, when we talk about those things, and, you know, you think about it. A baby whale and a baby seal has more rights than an unborn pregnant child does. In our court systems, we're more interested in making sure that the criminal's rights are observed than the victim's rights. Professing ourselves to be wise, we become as fools. The third thing I want you to understand and, and see when it comes to reality is not only was, is there a death of common sense, there is a corruption of religion. We have Christians today that have made their own idols and it talks about uh, people worshiping the creative things instead of the creator of the things here. What are some of the idols that you think we Christians have that we put before God? Let's just, let's just name them. I'm going to let you name them. I'm going to let you preach some of my sermon today. Money? Social media? Phones? iPhones? <laughs> Possessions? 
Huh? Oh, my, can you say the law? I get in trouble if I say that one. Did you say sports? Okay. I, well, that got me in trouble many times. Uh, entertainment? It's all your fault. I'll call your name out for Facebook. No, I'm not going to do that. Me, myself, and I, then Holy Trinity. Amen. Hey, you, you're doing good preaching this sermon. I'll let you up here and preach it. Amen. Well, we all hit them. And, and, and we're allowing those things to become gods to us. And how do you know if you have an idol in your life? Is it, do you love it more than your God? Do you love it more than your God? Number two, do you serve that idol more than you serve God? Anything you love, anything you fear, anything you put before God is an idol. Rich young ruler. There we go. Amen. Also, here's another thing. Uh, I've got to really run here, but uh, uncontrollable lust and sexual perversion. And we see this. America laughs at dirty movies and crude comedy and filthy jokes and profane language. And we have perverts getting up and uh, boldly, arrogantly demanding us to accept their lifestyles. And if we don't, they're calling us bigots and racialists. But also the death of a conscience. The Bible calls it without natural affections. Parents neglecting, abusing, and endangering their kids. Mothers who take their unborn children and abort them. Men or husbands that beat their wives. But here's another one, wives that beat their husbands. Children that are mentally, emotionally, psychologically, and sexually abused. Spouses divorcing other spouses because of extramarital affairs. With no regards to the sanctity and the fidelity of not just their marriage, but their own children. Now what are we to do about all this? Here we go. What, what should be our response? What can we do to bring God's glory back? Number one, you've got to make sure that you build your home on the Word of God. Build your home on the Word of God. Mothers and fathers, make sure you are building a firm foundation for your marriage and your children and your family. Remember, Jesus gave us a parable of two builders, one that built his house on the rock and one that built his house on the sand. And he said, him that built his house on the, the rock, when the floods and the rains and the winds and the storms of life come, it stood strong. But that person that built their home or their household on shifting, sinking sand, when the storms came, great was the fall of it. Make sure that you build your home, family, marriage, relationships, on the word of God. Number two, get under the ministry of a God-anointed minister. You need, you need to find someone that's God-called, God-appointed, God-anointed, someone that will not compromise biblical uh, convictions in order to cater to people's whims and whams. You need to find a preacher that preaches without fear and without favoritism. Three, we need to pray for America. Man, we need to put some calluses on our knees, don't we? We need to get down on our knees and pray for a divine intervention. Now, I'm going to say something. I didn't ask Franny if I could do this, but Franny, we've been, been watching your Facebook page. And uh, Amy and I, it was Franny's, right, that said, you said what? It, it doesn't matter what president we elect because God, Jesus is going to be king anyway. There we go. Yep. And she's right. Amen. That's what we've got to remember, and we've got to pray. And not only do we have to have courage to get out on our knees and um, callous our knees, but we also got to get up and stand up and not be ashamed of Jesus Christ. Number four, get involved in reaching a world around you and let them know that the only hope to change in America is Jesus Christ. You and I have got to some way, somehow, find a way to get into the hearts and homes of people. 
And what I found out about Facebook and YouTube is I'm getting into homes and hearts of people that would not come to this church. Some of them uh, have um, uh, affiliations and associations with me. Some of them are out of state. Some of them are not going to church at all, but they're hearing. And that's what we need to do. We need to find some way to get into the hearts and homes of these people. It's going to be more than just preaching the word of God from a podium, more than just teaching a Sunday school class uh, during Sunday morning. We're going to have to figure out a way to innovative, saturate this community, this city for the Lord Jesus Christ. My friend, if there isn't ever a time that we need to stand up and not be ashamed to proclaim Jesus, it's today. Jesus is the answer to America. He's the answer to the globe. He's the answer for every man and woman and boy and girl. What did Jesus say? John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto me but by the Father. In Acts 4, 12, there's no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. Let me tell you something about Jesus. Jesus is not just a good way. He's not just the best way to heaven. He's the only way to heaven. And you and I have got to get that message out because let me tell you something. I don't, you know, whoever you voted for, he's not the answer and she's not the answer. Jesus is the answer. I was at uh, Kroger's yesterday and um, I was looking over the, vegeta the, the aisle with all of them, trying to lose some weight, lost 14 pounds, but... Um, you know, I was looking at all the vegetables I could get, and there was this lady that had voted differently than I voted, and she was afraid to say too much, and I went over to her, and I said, ma'am, you've got every right to vote on who you want to vote for, and she said, well, you're one of the nicest and blank supporters <laughs> uh, that I've ever met, and you know what? I'm, I'm against all this rioting. I'm against all this plundering. I don't know who's behind it. I'm not smart enough to know that. I hear people with all their speculations and uh, imaginations, but I'll be honest with you. I, I don't know what's going on in America. I know something bad has happened somewhere, somehow. But let me tell you something. Joe Biden and Donald Trump is not the answer to America. Jesus is the answer to this nation. Amen. That's who we need to vote for. And I'm not happy with the candidate I voted for. I'm not. not. But guess what? I'm not going to tell you who it is. But I'm not happy. We didn't have much of a choice. Both of them were like two kids on a playground. Calling each other names and things like that. I'm, it disgraced me. I can say that about my candidate, but let me tell you something. It's not your political party. It's your relationship with Jesus that not only will change you, your heart, your home, your community, your city, but who knows, maybe nationwide, if we'd all just proclaim Jesus unashamedly to the world around us. Let's all stand and go to the Lord in prayer. I know I spoke over time today. I figured that you were getting tired of hearing about the book of Joe, or Judges, okay? Uh, so I had to hurry up and get that done. I'm thinking about preaching next Sunday about being an eagle Christian. You know, learning to soar with Jesus and don't hang around with turkeys and chickens, you know. that They stay, they stay on the ground, you know. Uh, but you need to soar like an eagle. So I'm thinking about doing that to encourage you a little bit through this time. I, I hope that you've learned something from the book of Judges. And I hope it's touched your heart and it's changed your heart and you're taking it home with you. Uh, Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, as a praise band comes, Lord, I, I just pray for us as uh, we're here today. And uh, Lord, if there's one here that has never accepted Christ as Savior and Lord, that they'll walk down this aisle and they'll give me the wonderful privilege of praying with them through a prayer of repentance, faith, and surrender. Lord, I pray for us that know Jesus. We've accepted Christ. We need to follow through with baptism. And Lord, I thank you that next Sunday may be a baptism here and Lord, I just thank you for that. And Lord, we've not seen those waters stirred in a long time, and it's concerned me. But Lord, I just pray that more people, whoever has accepted Christ as Savior and Lord, will go to the next step in baptism. Lord, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for all of us. 
God, I also pray for us who, who know you and have been baptized. Maybe we need to join this church. And, Lord, maybe we just need to rededicate our lives and realize that we're putting too much stock in, in politics and not enough in our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to use us to make the changes in our nation and our world abroad. So, Lord God, I don't know how you've reached us, how you've talked to us, how you've spoken to us, but, Lord, help us to have listening ears and a heating heart. And we'll make sure that you get the praise and honor and glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And amen. Amen.